Hello, everyone, and welcome to the mRNA Technologies Therapeutics and Vaccines My name is Nana Ohaka, and I'll be your host for today's session titled Maximizing mRNA Production, Atline Process Monitoring for Improved Purity and Yield. First, an item. So there seems to be some technical difficulties on the on one of the sites. So I'll do my own introduction. Uh, my name is Rok Zakernik. I'm the head of process development for plasmid DNA and mRNA products at Sartorius BS Separations. We are a Sartorius owned company focusing on manufacture, development, and use of monolithic chromatographic technology, which I'm excited about uh, to tell you about in today's presentation. The star of the show will be mRNA and how to maximize uh, the yields and purity to address the needs of the mRNA therapeutics, which are uh, fast emerging now in the post-COVID time. So we'll look at that in a second. Um, we have just under an hour together, in, in which time I would like to just remind us where we are post-COVID uh, with regards to mRNA, um, address what analytical bottlenecks there might be in uh, helping us to get towards purer products faster and to make more of the said product. Uh, I will describe one of our favorite topics, which is uh, IVT optimization, how we can squeeze more out of the IVT reaction, still the most expensive part of the mRNA production process. And then the majority of the talk will be focused around the purification of mRNA. And I will uh, show you examples of how we use affinity chromatography, multimodal chromatography, and last but not least, reverse chromatography, which um, we've been working hard on developing over the last few months. and. Uh, I want to show you how this type of chromatography removes not only double-stranded RNA, but also fragments and residual plasmid. And in the end, I'd like to uh, finish with an interesting case study on one of the, one of the um, most challenging types of RNA product uh, in development at, at the moment, which is self-amplifying RNA. So let's get started. Um, we've gone through... COVID times, which uh, I guess brought to our attention uh, the, the promise and also the delivery of mRNA technology as a very promising therapeutic modality. And we are looking at what happens with mRNA post-COVID, and we see a lot of therapies in the pipeline. Uh, of course, the majority still in the discovery and preclinical stage, but more and more are moving through phase one, phase two, towards phase three, and of course we have uh, already two marketed products, uh, which we probably all know. Uh, also the spectrum of diseases that the mRNA and related technologies can address is getting broader and broader, and I think there's not a week gone by that we don't uh, find one more interesting paper on yet another uh, novel therapeutic application. 
So the industry seems to agree that there is that there is big promise, big future for mRNA um, as a therapeutic modality. And so we need to invest in better uh, production and analytical platforms to meet the needs of the future. Apart from the versatility of the therapeutic areas, there's also versatility of applications. And here I, I uh, remind ourselves of, um, of three major classes, if we can uh, classify them by uh, the number of dosings as well as the mass of dosing. And if we, uh, if uh, quite some world population received um, one or two doses of mRNA as an infectious disease vaccine, um, in in context of cancer vaccine, we would be receiving more doses and more um, and higher mass of mRNA drug substance applied. And if we move towards mRNA encoded protein therapy, these numbers will rise further. What we're, I try to say here is that uh, small doses come with small problems, large doses come with large problems, uh, particularly in terms of production requirements as well as purity requirements. Uh, the purity requirements will go ever higher, uh, particularly because with, a, with repeated dosing and with higher mass of dosing, any residual uh, impurity left uh, can be detrimental to the efficacy of the drug. And so this is what we worry about um, in our labs where we develop new tools, new approaches, new technologies, as well as new processes. We have an active lab developing processes uh, for mRNA production. And I would like to share with you our thinking, um, the recent innovations in how we see some of the solutions to address higher productivity and higher purity of mRNA in the future. I do like to start by reminding ourselves also that mRNA is quite unlike any other biopharmaceutical molecule out there in multiple respects. One is the size, the molecular size of it is uh, an order of magnitude larger than what was previously considered a large biopharmaceutical drug like an IgG. IgG is a 150 kilodalton product. Uh, the smallest mRNA that we're dealing with is already exceeding one megadalton. So we are dealing with molecules that are megadalton large, and this brings with it uh, technical challenges as well as opportunities. We're also working with not a neutral molecule, but at the very, with a very negatively charged molecule, which again brings with a whole host of technical challenges, but also a very selective a physical chemical property that we can utilize uh, for both capture and for analytics. Um, it is also a relatively highly hydrophobic molecule under certain conditions. If we can induce the right conditions to induce hydrophobicity, we can, uh, we can make use of that property again as a purification tool, particularly as a polishing step, which I'll address later on but also as an analytical tool. And here we, we have uh, ample data, data showing how hydrophobicity can be used uh, to determine the molecular size of mRNA and to distinguish between different sizes of uh, mRNA chains. And finally, uh, if from monoclonal antibody field, we're used to uh, affinity purification via protein A ligands. Here, mRNA thankfully lends itself uh, with another interesting feature, the poly A tail, which mRNA needs for in vivo stability, can also be used uh, to the advantage of purification and analytics as a selective marker that uh, affinity ligand, which is a complementary um, oligonucleotide chain, of oligo DT, can be used as an affinity ligand to capture only mRNA that is polydenylated out of a mixture and out of a sea and ocean of other impurities. And these are the, the properties that we'll be utilizing for the rest of this talk, uh, but to purify um, and to analyze mRNA molecule. 
mRNA uh, is often quoted as being single-stranded RNA. Um, I think this this representation is not entirely accurate. And uh, recently, uh, RNA conferences started showing um, structures like this. So this is a on the right hand side we see a modeling a theoretical model of what um, in this case an EGFP RNA probably looks like. I think it's quite hard to actually know. Uh, what the structure is at any one point under any one set of uh, conditions. But the point is that this is not strictly speaking a single stranded molecule. It actually contains a lot of, um, a lot of uh, double strandedness about it, um, a, lot of, a lot of secondary structure, and it's of course got a tertiary structure of its own, uh, making it quite a complex molecule. This uh, secondary structure might change um, with with conditions that we apply. Uh, so it might differ between one set of pH values and another set of pH. And it's actually a field where we would, I think, welcome more academic research to help also process developers understand what goes on with mRNA secondary structure uh, per defined set of conditions. But this is not all. Of course, for therapy, we want to encode all sorts of uh, proteins in this, and so the structure of mRNA might differ between lengths of uh, lengths of the coding sequence. Uh, and so, I think we're quite some way away from getting a complete understanding of of this uh, of this structure yet. And it's an underlying complexity of the work that we try to do when we develop purification and analytical tools. Having said that, um, multiple purification platforms have already emerged, been published on, uh, reported. Uh, I, I like to share the purification platform that we find works very well in a scalable fashion that is compatible with GMP manufacturing standards. Um, and when we talk about mRNA purification platform, we start the discussion not with IVT reaction, but actually with the production of plasmid DNA itself as one of the key raw materials needed in an mRNA production process that carries with it complexities of its own. And so uh, the, for us, mRNA production process starts essentially with fermentation of bacteria encoding the plasmid of interest the plasma that encodes the mRNA sequence of interest, followed by alkali lysis of the, of the fermented material, um, E. coli material, which again has challenges of its own, particularly when we try to scale up the process to clinically relevant amounts of plasmid. Alkali lysis becomes problematic and needs tight control over the process, uh, which typically batch alkali lysis doesn't necessarily address very well. Um, and then the downstream process of the plasmid contains the clarification steps, capture of, of uh, D, D, uh, pDNA, typically with anion exchange columns. We like to use the Simultus DEAE for capture of plasmid DNA and for removal of cellular uh, components and RNA, followed by linearization, uh, which produces linearized double-stranded DNA sequence, but also contains uh, the enzyme that we use for linearization and contains any residual endotoxins, which came from E. coli lysis. And that is dealt with uh, with a C4 HLD, meaning a butyl high ligand density column operated under hydrophobic interaction conditions. Uh, we make use of the fact that nucleic acid can be made hydrophobic under particular um, conditions. In this case, we apply ammonium sulfate uh, to isolate highly pure uh, linear plasmid that can be then, after buffer exchange, used for IVT. And IVT reaction, <clears throat> as I mentioned, is one of the most expensive uh, steps in this production process. Uh, we've spent a lot of uh, time and effort on developing tools to monitor IVT reaction to make a better higher yielding uh, IVT reaction through the use of headline analytics, which I'll mention later on. And then the, the majority of what I'll be describing also later on will be the toolbox needed uh, to isolate uh, 
mRNA versus a capture step where we typically use either affinity, oligo-DT, or multimodal columns such as Prima-S or a swiper that we'll, I'll describe later on, and then polishing by reverse phase or a hydrophobic interaction chromatography. This is followed by buffer exchange into, into formulation buffer, typically citrate uh, and sterile filter to deliver us a um, highly pure mRNA drug substance. Now, when we when we talk about selecting the right uh, the right tools for the for the purification, we need to think about um, again these challenges of mRNA, which are large size, high uh, charge, and so forth. And um, we need to think about what is the right chromatographic technology to apply for here. And this is where uh, Sartori's BS Separations has come up, up with a very uh, useful technology, namely monolith uh, chromatographic columns, which are quite unique uh, and quite beneficial for purification of very large biomolecules such as mRNA. Um, because of their unique physical properties, which I'm not going to describe in any detail here, but they have been amply reviewed and described elsewhere, we can achieve something called convective mass transport uh, as opposed to diffusive uh, mass transport. We achieve, and this has been shown now for mRNA and for a whole lot of other molecules, gentle purification in a way that is highly scalable and contains high uh, and, and offers high capacity. Uh, we have the nearly three decades experience of developing the right tools, the right monoliths for particular applications, so we can apply really any um, any chemistry that we want. And so we also always think about what's the next best chemistry for a particular application. Um, what we can achieve with this particular technology, which looks uh, like this, by the way, so a monolith is a block polymer uh, that contains an integrated network of channels with very precisely defined channel sizes, typically between two to, um, well, with, with a defined set of channel sizes, which are either two micrometer or six micrometer. And we have very tight control over the size of the channels and the channels are themselves functionalized with ligand of our choice. So this, um, this interconnected network of channels has about 60% porosity, doesn't contain any dead end pores meaning that also uh, molecules don't have to diffuse anywhere, unlike in porous particle chromatography. And it's this diffusion that would make purification slow and, and uh, lose its resolution. In case of monolith chromatography, there's no dead end pores, there's no diffusion, and so we can come up with very fast, um, fast purification with high resolution. Uh, I will show you examples in a later slide. Uh, because we have convective mass transfer, transport, uh, we have flow rate independent capacity, flow rate independent resolution. We have low, relatively low back pressure, even at high flow rates. And we have high binding capacity for large biomolecules. Uh, this is quite unusual for molecules of megadalton size if we used any other type of chromatography. Um, Everything that I said is backed up by a lot of prior data. Here we see, for example, a, uh, an example of the resolution of uh, different oligonucleotides of their various length. You can see uh, what a nice resolution we can achieve and sharp elution peaks, which gives us, of course, analytical uh, precision between um, tumors, threemers, formers, and so forth, we can get really nice peak-to-peak uh, -peak resolution. And what is most, even more important, we can do so in a flow rate independent manner. On the right-hand side, we show that um, resolution between a set of analytes does not change if we increase the analytical flow rate from five column volumes per minute up to 10, even up to 20 column volumes per minute, the resolution between peaks does not decrease. And again, this has been shown time and time again for any kind of uh, analytes, including, as I'll later show, for mRNA um, in context of, for example, IVT reaction. 
flow rate independent capacity again has been shown from multiple analytes it's quite unusual uh, we oftentimes have to have to um, explain this to uh, um, to newcomers in the monolith chromatography field because typically you would be used to, to seeing breakthrough curves uh, like shown on the left hand side where breakthrough occurs earlier and earlier as a function of increasing flow rate meaning the binding capacity would decrease with increasing flow rate whereas with a with a monolith being a convective mass transfer device uh, flow rate has no impact on dynamic binding capacity and so breakthrough occurs at three different flow rates overlay nearly perfectly and this is this is a unique an exciting feature of monolith chromatography that we can make use of to increase flow rates in general when we purify analytes and of course leads to intensification um, of, uh, of bioprocesses. One of the key aspects of mRNA manufacture will be, and we'll discuss this now in quite some detail, the IVT reaction. And what I try to show here is that it's a multi-component reaction, not standardized at all across the industry. Uh, we count on average about 13 components to the IVT reaction. There's no standardized protocol. There's no standard um, standard set of reagents, although people tend to agree that you need at least nucleotides, DNA, polymerase, um, buffer, and some magnesium. How much of each varies greatly. And then you have different strategies of um, co-transcriptional capping, post-transcriptional capping, uh, co-transcriptional polydenylation, post-transcriptional polydenylation, and so forth. So there's a whole uh, variety of different approaches to IVT at the moment, um, calling for further unification of the field, but also calling for, um, for better analytical tools to actually make sense of such a complex reaction. And I'll be describing one one two in the next slides and second thing that i want to uh, join with this thought is that when we deal with optimization of such a complex um, unit operation as ivt reaction we do not want to have slow feedback loops we do not want to perform a reaction send it uh, to analytical departments in a neighboring street and get the result one one week later uh, we want to have our reaction analyzed at line or online where we want to have feedback immediately to be able to uh, optimize and to react uh, perhaps to the outcome of the reaction both to save time but also to save cost and this is um, at the core of our philosophy to have at line analytics where it's most needed meaning right next to the to the development, to the center of development activity. And this is why we developed PathFix analytical biochromatography tool um, that we wish to bring to every development lab to enable process developers to have data available in real time. And how this works, I will show you. In context of mRNA process, we see and have demonstrated the utility of this in all sorts of um, unit operations from raw material control, where we can monitor the purity of plasmid, purity of NTPs, purity of capping reagent, uh, also to an extent enzyme purity, to IVT reaction monitoring, which I'll mention later, to DSP optimization, um, uh, and both, as, both as a tool in its own right, so a small a scale down uh, DSP tool, as well as for in-process analytics, and then of course, as drug substance, uh, purity analytics and drug substance stability tools. So we see chromatography uh, delivering value at every single stage of an mRNA process. And let me give you a few examples now um, of how chromatography has already delivered on this promise in context of mRNA. The first one, like I mentioned, um, is IVT as the most expensive unit operation, we want to keep track of it, ideally in near real time. And uh, monolith chromatography, combining now the power of high resolution at fast flow rates, um, as well as uh, 
having this high resolution that I mentioned earlier, we managed to develop analytical methods that last anywhere between three to maximally eight minutes that resolve all of the key components of an IBT reaction, mRNA, plasmid DNA, nucleotides, and capping reagent. These are the key components of the IBT reaction, which uh, are related to each other and how they're related, we need to figure out during process optimization. And so in sub three minutes, on an example on the right-hand side, we have a readout of how much mRNA is in our sample um, and how much residual or how much NTP levels and how much capping reagent is left at any one point in time. And we get this information three minutes after we inject the sample, meaning in the time frame that's required to still be able to react to a potential change. Yeah. It's a very useful tool. We also have what I like to call um, the protein um, protein A of, of mRNA. So the oligo DT affinity column can also be used in an analytical setting to give us information about how much polyadenylated mRNA is in our sample at any one time. And we can combine the uh, analytics on the left with analytics on the right um, to build really uh, an accurate picture of what our process looks like at any one point during process time. Um, and we get this information really in, 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 in a very few minutes from sampling. The most basic example of what we can do with analytics like this is that we sample the IVT reaction at defined sampling time points, for example, every 15 minutes, every half an hour, whatever. Typically, a reaction takes between minimally, I would say, 90 minutes to typically 210 minutes, so on average, two to three hours. So sampling every 15 minutes turns out to be completely sufficient, um, even under situations where we need to be feeding the reaction. We can, of course, increase the frequency of sampling if we want to, in principle, we could be injecting samples in a staggered fashion. So you can really sample the reaction uh, with the frequency that you like. And for a well-functioning reaction, what we see is an increase in mRNA as a function of time and a decrease in NTPs as a function of time and a more or less or a very gradual decrease of a capping reagent. In this case, I show an example of ARCA capping reagent, but same has been done for um, most other capping reagents currently available commercially. If you're interested in the concept, I refer you to the to the paper um, referenced where we describe the concept in a bit more detail as well as the applications. So this is uh, the first of the analytical pillars that we like to apply in an mRNA process. Second being, like I mentioned, oligo DT to tighter polyadenylated mRNA concentration uh, at any one point, and the third one being the purity analytics, which is a reverse phase chromatography that we call CIMAC SDVB, SDVB standing for starring divinyl benzene. How is this used in, uh, in the context of large-scale mRNA production? Well, if we had optimized our IVT protocol at small scale, for example, at 50 microliters, 100 microliters, um, then we want to scale up towards larger volumes. Um, we can apply a batch approach or a fed batch approach, but if we apply fed batch approach, then we need to understand how rapidly our nucleotides are being consumed as a function of time, also as a function of polymerase, also as a function of plasmid, which all contributes to the rate of consumption. Um, and so we, we have to apply this headline monitoring to understand the rate of consumption then add the feeds, typically the feeds con consist of a mix of nucleotides and magnesium to prolong the duration of the reaction. And we've shown this both in simple um, thermal shaker systems as well as in automated bioreactor system such as Ember 250. Um, we showed, for example, that it, by getting good understanding of kinetics of nucleotide consumption, you can pre-program the bioreactor to automatically feed a mixture of nucleotides and magnesium to prolong the reaction automatically, so you no longer have to feed the reaction yourself. Yeah, the bioreactor does that for you. 
Um, but the prerequisite for that is understanding of the kinetics of the reaction, which is only possible if you have the right analytical tool at hand, analytical tool that gives you the concentration of mRNA of nucleotides of capping reagent in real times. Um, so the, 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 the consequence, the output of this is actually a better utilization of the expensive components of the reaction, meaning of the enzyme, which doesn't get consumed, of plasmid, which also doesn't get consumed, uh, and actually we just add the cheaper parts, the magnesium and, and nucleotides. And so if you do the maths, the per gram cost of mRNA produced under fat batch condition can be up to 50% less than mRNA produced in batch. Right. Um, again, this, is, this has been described in, uh, in a publication referenced below. In the interest of time, I'd like to move on um, to show you some examples then of how mRNA is purified, how we approach purification while still combining these tools of ETLINE monitoring to give us information about the process. We, uh, it's Sartorius BS separation, we manufacture monoliths, um, which, as mentioned, are excellent uh, purification and analytical tools. And we also have the flexibility of manufacturing them in, in a whole number of desirable formats. Of course, scalable, GMP compatible formats, which we produce from one milliliter up to 40 liter columns, prepacked columns is, is one. Um, useful technology, but we can also scale the technology down. Namely, we can make 50 and 100 microliter uh, units, which are packaged either as a 96 well plate or a syringe based format. Uh, and those are very useful as scale down models. So you can multi parallelize your um, development by using a 96 well format in any major chemistries available. For example, for mRNA, uh, one of the most popular uh, ligands is, of course, oligo-DT, the affinity ligand. And there we played uh, a little bit with, with the purification of polyvinylated mRNA. And we asked the question, what additives or what conditions would increase the binding capacity of oligo-DT in order to utilize the, um, the, 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 the ligand better. We knew from, from prior literature that salt concentration is one of the key factors. So sodium chloride concentration directly impacts the binding capacity um, for mRNA, uh, but other factors were not necessarily published yet. In a 96 well format, we could throw any chemical we found in the lab at, uh, at the column. And in retrospect, it should be obvious uh, th at that point it wasn't, but guanidine and magnesium stood out as very useful uh, chemicals that significantly increased binding capacity for mRNA. And so we have actually found that by, by using guanidine instead of sodium chloride, we could nearly double uh, the binding capacity compared to sodium chloride. And for EGFP, we hit, reproducibly hit six gram per liter binding capacity of oligo-DT monolith. This was enabled by use of 96 well plates, which are operated under very simple vacuum manifold um, environment, if you want, can also be operated with, uh, with a centrifuge. Anyway, they do not require any sophisticated uh, chromatographic equipment. They just require either vacuum manifold, or centrifuge, and a UV detector, such as nanodrop. And so you can build up these nice DOE uh, design spaces and get a better understanding of what governs the purification. Then if this is to be useful as a scaled down model, of course, it needs to transfer uh, seamlessly. And we've shown that conditions that have shown, for example, five, uh, six uh, gram per liter binding capacity in 96 well plate showed us 5.5 um, gram per liter capacity in column format, i.e. they were um, approximately within the margin of analytical error there. Um, 
and we've shown that you can use 96 of eight as a nice scaled down model for column chromatography. Uh, I, I again refer you for further reading to a short industrial publication that we uh, that we published in Bioprocess International nearly two years ago. Uh, whilst we also discovered the beauty of oligo DT chromatography elsewhere, for example, um, out of curiosity, we put mRNA purified by oligo DT on a stability study. This was EGFP molecule, which arguably is relatively stable. Uh, compared to other constructs, but nonetheless, we were shocked to find that even after a month of incubating mRNA at 37 degrees, a relatively little fragmentation was observed by the agarose gel or bioanalyzer, whereas a uh, classic lab um, mRNA isolation kit led to relatively rapid degradation of the same molecule um, under the same condition. We've heard reports of similar behavior now from around the world, and we believe it's due to both gentle purification by um, oligo DT monolith, for the reasons of basically column architecture that I described earlier, and it being operated under near neutral um, chromatographic conditions, as opposed to applying relatively harsh precipitation uh, chemicals uh, under high shear centrifugation conditions and possibly it's also linked to precipitation not removing all of the residual contaminants. We know, for example, when we look at precipitated mRNA with our analytical platform, we quite often find relatively high levels of residual nucleotides uh, still present in mRNA. So precipitation, um, the, despite its historical use, is not actually the most efficient purification tool, nor does it seem to lead to stable mRNA, all of which um, affinity chromatography and chromatography that I'll describe later on do perform. Finally, what does a typical experiment, an oligo DT experiment, actually look like? Um, to us, it seems one of the most straightforward tools available to the industry you formulate mRNA under certain percentage, certain concentration of salt, typically sodium chloride, but as I mentioned, you can choose other salts like guanidine. Uh, the high salt is needed to achieve a, a, a binding of polyadenylated mRNA with the oligo DT ligand, whilst everything that's non polyadenylated binds, uh, washes through. Sorry. Sometimes we perform a wash to wash off any contaminants that might, for whatever reason, still be binding to the column or to the mRNA that's bound to the column, uh, but it's not uh, washed through in the, in the flow through. And then elution happens with a very low conductivity buffer, typically five to 10 millimolar citrate, or simply deionized water. And what we always find is that um, this purification removes, let's call it 99% of all contaminants, but it does not remove double-stranded RNA. Um, and it, like I'll sh show later on, it also doesn't remove fragments um, um, that may co-purify with mRNA. Right, so much on affinity chromatography. I want to uh, just zoom through an alternative that is available in cases where affinity is not possible. So when you work with non-polydenylated RNA, circular RNA, for example, is an, is, is an example of non-polydenylated RNAs, or when, um, for whatever reason, oligo DT is not an option, we have developed a family of multimodal NI exchange hydrogen bonding ligands. Uh, one of them is called Prima S, which is the first generation multimodal ligands that showed uh, high binding capacity for mRNA, high clearance of plasmid and, and nucleotides, um, and a high recovery for mRNA. So typically we would get 85 to 90% recovery with this tool. Um, and a typical example is shown here in the central chromatogram. We apply the, the sample um, and perform a wash 
of the plasmid. The plasmid is, is removed in something called high salt wash, and then the elution of mRNA happens with a, a step in pH. So the high pH is required for elution of mRNA, followed by immediate neutralization with a strongly acidic buffer. Um, an example of how we can utilize ETLINE analytical chromatography is uh, now shown here. We also described this in a recent paper in electrophoresis, which I invite you to read. Um, basically, we would ask ourselves, where do the IVT proteins go? So T7, um, pyrophosphatase, and RNAs inhibitor, where do they go? How can we track them? We applied our PATFIX HPLC system with an add-on with a fluorescence detector, which significantly increases the signal for protein, um, well, for protein signal. And UV itself would show a very small um, chromatographic peak, but with the use of fluorescence, we were able to amplify this signal significantly. And indeed, we were able to show and track each of these uh, IVT proteins in the high salt wash step. So we were able to quite conclusively show that um, high salt wash, uh, which also removes the plasmid, by the way, um, removes each one of those three um, IVT proteins. Importantly, because the, uh, the chromatography depends on a um, high pH elution, we're often asked about the stability of this mRNA. And uh, again, on EGFP, we were able to show that the material that was purified by Prima S was stable, certainly at room temperature for, for just under a month. And at 37 degrees, uh, it showed um, some percentage of a small level of fragmentation. But in principle, uh, this is a chromatography, an alternative chromatography to oligo-DT, which delivers mRNA with high recovery, high binding capacity. Uh, six gram per liter here is quite standard. Um, and good stability. We are working also on next generation ligands, and we, we are preparing for launch of something that we call Swiper, uh, which builds on the Prima S family um, properties. So again, high binding capacity for non polydenylated or uh, for any mRNA, essentially, uh, but obviating the need for high pH for elution. So we developed the ligand with a lower PKA, um, which requires now a pH of 7, 7.5 for elution. Um, and so we have now demonstrated proof of concept that we can have, again, high recovery. Again, we talk about 90% recovery of mRNA at near neutral pH at room temperature directly from the IVT. We separate the plasmid uh, in, in the high salt wash and elute uh, highly pure mRNA. So all of these tools are now in the toolbox available for when and if you need them. And please do reach out for more information. Again, this is a study that's been published in IJMS very recently. I invite you to, um, if this is of interest, to read more details there. And finally, um, I will skip through to this to, to address the final subject that I wanted to share with you which is how do we remove uh, the contaminants which do co-purify through oligo-DT because they are inherently and strongly bound to polyadenylated mRNA. And I'm talking, of course, about double-stranded RNA. This, the industrial standard still, and I think for some time to, to be, is reverse phase chromatography. Reverse phase chromatography, in our case, we use styrene divinyl benzene, um, as not only as a ligand, but also as a backbone. It um, is used in combination with acetonitrile, um, sometimes in elevated conditions, but often also just at room temperature. Concentrations of acetonitrile are somewhere between 7.5 and maximally 18%. This eludes all of the mRNA of interest. And what we typically find is that early fractions uh, here, for example, fractions E1, E2, E3 contain low levels of double-stranded signal as measured by J2 dot blot, and uh, a strong 
J2 signal is triggered by the late eluting fractions, uh, which are either at the tail end of the RNA peak or indeed then in the strip fraction. This works reliably, either is a linear gradient or is a step gradient, so we can really make quite simplified um, methods here. We were able to show that step works in a scalable fashion. We scaled it up to um, hundreds of milligram purification, and we always see reproducibly the early fraction, which, as I later on mentioned, contains short fragments from a highly purified central fraction. In, this, in, in the right-hand side chromatogram, this is E2, and the tail was E3. And then the strip contains, uh, presumably, the longer double-stranded fragments. It's a single-step removal, not only of double-stranded RNA, but also, as I'll now show you, of fragments and of residual plasmid template if that one had not been removed by DNAs after IVT. So I mentioned the early fractions contain um, fragments, and we were able to track them quite nicely by fragment analyzer. We show that the early elution fractions from SDVB here called E1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth, contain fractions which, uh, which are significantly shorter than the target mRNA. And the closer we get to the main peak, the closer we get um, to the nominal size of mRNA. We are also able to show that these fragments, once isolated, no longer really bind to oligo -DT. And so we explain this by um, by the fact that these were, in fact, annealed, hybridized, short fragments, probably aborted um, IVT products that did bind to the target mRNA, which was polydenylated. Uh, and because they were bound to the target, oligo -DT doesn't by itself remove them, whereas reverse phase chromatography does. And so this is the second impurity that would otherwise uh, not be removed. And we've also shown, by the way, with a control experiment, that this fragmentation is not triggered and caused by the purification itself, mm -hmm. but it's actually um, carries through from the IVT reaction. Finally, we're also able to track residual plasmid DNA. So sometimes we apply DNAs after IVT, sometimes we don't. If we don't, oligo -DT does a very good job of clearing uh, the plasmid, but some low level of plasmid always still re remains in the elution, presumably again due to the binding with, with RNA in some fashion that's not yet well understood. But reverse phase uh, removes even this residual plasmid here in fraction E1, such that the E3, the main fraction in this case, is completely free of residual plasmid. And by qPCR, you would not and by other analytical methods, you would not be able to distinguish between DNA-treated sample um, and, um, and chromatographically treated sample. So we love reverse phase for, for those three reasons. So not only does it remove double-stranded RNA, like it's been known, it also removes fragments and any residual plasmid, thereby also obviating the need for use of DNAs in the process. So you can save one uh, one enzymatic treatment. Uh, we have just enough time to also take you then finally through a case study where that hopes to bring all of this together. So now we move the scale of operation uh, to much larger constructs, which are more challenging to purify. So self-amplifying RNA is now 10,000 uh, nucleotides long. How are we going to make it? Well, we need good analytical tools to monitor production, um, and we need good purification tools for high recovery and high purity of the final product. So we use here self-amplifying RNA, kindly provided by our collaborators. And first of all, we had to produce it. So we used CMAC Prima S IVT monitoring tool. And the very first experiment went terribly because we did not add the capping reagent. We thought we'd save ourselves some, some uh, money <laughs> in the early optimization. But the atline monitoring quickly showed us that something was off. And we thought, OK, it's obviously the capping, in this case, clean cap AU reagent. As soon as we put um, some molarity of 
clean cap into the reaction, the productivity shot up. And we were able to track the productivity as a function of time uh, by CMAC Prima S. The raw chromatogram is shown down below on the left, and the, um, let's call it semi-optimized reaction shown on top right, where we could hit uh, five to six grams per liter quite easily with this reaction. We then uh, purified, captured the self-amplifying RNA with swiper, multimodal chromatographic column that I mentioned earlier uh, in the fashion that I described. So near neutral purification, elution with pH 7.5 with a high recovery, 80% recovery, uh, beautiful chromatography, especially given the size uh, of this construct. It was a challenging purification, but worked really nicely with swiper. Uh, this is the left-hand side chromatogram, the prep, and we followed the purity of each fraction with TMAC Prima S. And you can see that in the load, which is the topmost chromatogram there, um, we saw, of course, the residual clean cap and nucleotides, and on the right-hand side, the self-amplifying RNA. The nucleotides wash through the column. That's line two, the light blue line. Uh, line three shows us the plasmid. I mentioned that the swiper in the high salt wash removes the plasmid. And elution, which was elution done with pH 7.5, uh, recovered only the self-amplifying RNA. The integrity of it was measured by fragment analyzer. There was some uh, fragmentation still observed, like you'd expect for the size of molecule. And what we did then, we applied reverse phase chromatography. Um, uh, again, like mentioned, in a linear gradient between 7.5 and 18% acetonitrile in the presence of iron pairing reagent, um, which again did three things uh, for us. It removed the double-stranded RNA, so the majority of the peak, elution peak there, was double-stranded RNA free, and we focused the double-stranded material in the late eluting fractions, E9, E10, E11. Reverse phase chromatography also removed the fragments, as is shown by fragment analyzer on the right-hand side. So any fragments that were left after the capture purification were not present in the elution. And, and I'm not showing this data here, but it's available, um, the residual plasmid um, uh, that was left in low levels after swiper was then also removed. So the material was really highly pure, and we're currently working on biological characterization of this material uh, with Tron Institute, and we're very excited about it. So this is the case study, I, and I appreciate fully that I'm taking you through a lot of material, but we are excited about the work that is happening here, and we're open to collaboration. We have a process development lab here. And we're eager to discuss and to share, um, to share ideas and, and concepts about the need that the industry has for headline monitoring for better understanding of the process so that we can get higher yielding processes faster. That's, that's our mission. And uh, if I've not convinced you of that, please, um, please join us also for our monolith summer symposium that takes place in a few months in the beautiful coastline of Slovenia, where we'll hear a lot of uh, presentations about the use of monoliths, both for mRNA, for plasmid DNA, and for all sorts of other interesting modalities. That's it from my side, and I think we have a few minutes left for questions. So I, I see there are some questions coming in. Um, I hope you can hear me well. There was one question I see about lot to lot variation for monolith. Um, so the manufacturing process for monolith production is highly validated. We've recently launched something called the high reproducibility uh, product line that's particularly de uh, dedicated to the AAV field um, where very, very fine control over the um, separation of full and empty caps that is necessary, and monoliths currently the only chromatographic technology to our knowledge that's able to provide a lot-to-lot -lot reproducibility between columns that actually supports 
the, the gene therapy field to achieve the separation between M2 for capsid that's required. So a lot to lot reproducibility um, should be really rather high, um, but all the documentation um, that's necessary to support GMP manufacture is available to our customers as well as our technical support line. So if you have any questions about the technology, please do reach out to our tech support team. I see another question on uh, on step pollution. So uh, there's a question on if we've tried step pollution with SDVB. Um, so indeed, we've tried to turn linear pollution gradient into step, and that worked uh, remarkably well. Um, we're now exploring how reproducible is the step between different constructs. This is work that's currently ongoing. We hope that actually we'd be able to show that, um, let's say, one size fits more or less all, that we can take a predefined concentration of acetonitrile um, and apply it to a whole range of, uh, of mRNA constructs and always achieve comparable uh, purity. Uh, but otherwise, for, for EGFP, and but, um, we've already demonstrated that we can take linear into step and and retain the I think 85% recovery that we've shown there. But do reach out for, for more technical data. Okay, uh, thank you for another question. What is the minimum length of poly A tail needed for all ego DT purification? Um, I can say there that we we test our columns on a 10 mer, um, so we know that 10 uh, oligo 10 so oligo uh, how to put it a 10 mer is already sufficient, but in practice what we see is that most mRNA constructs contain at least 40 45 uh, nucleotide poly A tail, which appears to be more than sufficient, but we have to bear in mind that particularly as the size of RNA increases, the relative length of poly A is ever shorter, and oligo-DT has a quite a tough job of finding a relatively short poly A tail in a sea of all other sequences. And so um, this is something that I think requires further exploration, particularly in context of self-amplifying RNA, where you can imagine that 100 nucleotides um, competes against 10,000 nucleotides of the same molecule. Uh, and so oligo-DT has a job to, to, to find them in this big blob that is SARNA. Thank you, Rock. That's all the time we have for questions today, and thank you for a great session. Apologies for any technical difficulties that anyone may have experienced. If anyone submitted a question that wasn't addressed, keep in mind that the speaker will reach out to you directly. This session was recorded. You'll receive a notification in 24 hours when the on-demand session is available for viewing. Before you log off, please take a moment to complete the feedback form so we can continue to improve your digital week experience. On behalf of Informa Connect Life Sciences, have a great day. Thank you.